Good morning, everyone. Welcome once again to Sunday Bible School. I hope that all of you are well. Let's bow down our heads and pray to begin our time in the Word. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. Faithfulness in everything that we experience in this life. The strength that we have in our bodies, the clarity of mind that we enjoy. We thank you, Lord, for all of these gifts. We know that we do not deserve them, but you give them anyway. Most of all, we thank you for your word, that you have made it available to us, and that we have the freedom to study it in this land. We pray that you might give us what we don't have, that you might teach us what we don't know, and that you might empower us to obey what we disobey. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue in our doctrinal series this morning. And uh, I was told by Pastor Mike that you went through the first uh, lesson on the doctrine of God last time. And we continue in that lesson this morning. Just to remind you that in our doctrinal statement uh, on, on God, we state that we worship and serve the only true God who revealed himself in the Bible as three persons sharing one indivisible essence in the mystery of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So we are studying the different parts of this doctrine. And at this time, we are studying the doctrine about God the Father. Uh, soon we will go through the doctrine of God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, we will also tackle the matter of the triunity of the Godhead, which many people struggle with. So, but each in due time. So today we will, we will tackle what he is like. And this is just part one. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that we want to achieve by studying the doctrine of God is to be able to define the attributes of God. And we will study three of them this morning. And, but most importantly, when we study what the Bible says about God, I hope that it is not just an exercise in adding information to our brains, but in experiencing transformation in our hearts because it is important for us to know God not just intellectually but more importantly spiritually so we'd like to make a personal application for example of the of each of the attributes of God that we will encounter this morning okay we ask the question very often when crisis happens, like when the pandemic happens, why is it in times of crisis, many people ask, where is God? You know? When a typhoon happens, where is God? When an earthquake happens, where is God? When all of this is happening, where is he? Why is he not stopping all of these things? Is he not powerful enough to stop all of these things? Do you feel the same way sometimes? And when you encounter, let's say, disease, no? or let's say physical inabilities, no? Uh, I had just taken a leave uh, from teaching and preaching because of certain health issues that I'm struggling with. And so we ask this question, where is God when all of this is happening? I think that the answer is that he's right there. He never left. And that you do not sense him is your problem, not his. Because God never leaves. He's never not there. And people ask, why is God not here? Where is he? Where, why is he not present? It is because they do not have a knowledge of him. Sometimes we blame God for many things that happen in our lives, but, and that uh, 
Sometimes we feel that God is not present when we, mo when we need Him the most, when we encounter difficulties in our lives, when we are in the midst of crisis. No? Many of us ask that question when the pandemic happened. When the, when the lockdown began in March 15 of 2020, many of us ask that question, where is he? Well, the answer, as I said, is that he's always there. He's always present. In the midst of crisis, in the midst of a super typhoon, in the midst of an earthquake, in the midst of everything, he's there. In fact, the Bible tells us, and may I suggest to you this morning and comment to your hearts, that God is sovereign, and so everything that happens to us ultimately originates from Him. Let me read you, it's not in the, in the PowerPoint, but let me read you a verse in Isaiah 45. Um, it's a... It's a long chapter, so I won't read the whole of it. But Isaiah 45 talks about how God chose a pagan king named Cyrus to be his instrument. No? So Isaiah 45 and verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him, and to loose the belts of kings. Now this king does not know God. To open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I will go before you to level the exalted places. God will give him victory and he did have victory. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. These are the defensive facilities of all of his enemies. He was able to break them all down. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. That's amazing. Cyrus does not know God. He's a pagan king. And he was one of the most powerful kings in history. He did not know God, yet God calls him by his name. For the sake of my servant Jacob, and Israel, my chosen. I call you by your name. I name you though you do not know me. Now, just for context, Cyrus was the king who signed the decree to let the Jews go back to Jerusalem at the end of 70 years of exile. And you will find his name in the book of Esther the book of Nehemiah, you'll find his name in the Chronicles, the history of the Jews. He was the one who signed the order, the decree for the Israelites to come back, to go back to Jerusalem. And Cyrus is a pagan king. He did not know God. Then in verse 5 of Isaiah 45, the Lord said, I am the Lord, there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. So, beloved, there's no other God, actually. There's no other power in the universe. There's only God. There's not even this thing that we call chance. There's only God. And hear this. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, speaking again to Cyrus, that people may know this is the purpose that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Now listen to this. I form light and create darkness. That's a recollection of creation. God said, let there be what? Light. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. So where was God in March 11, 2011, when a 9.8 earthquake hit the east of Tokyo and caused one of the worst tsunamis that, ever, that was ever recorded in history? Where was God? He caused the earthquake. 
Isaiah 45, 7 tells us that. For what purpose? We don't always understand. But God's purposes are, are always for his glory and for our benefit. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Now, many people think that when they get into a crisis or when a crisis hits, God is not aware of the crisis that I just read to you from Isaiah that he's actually allowing the crisis or causing the crisis by allowing it. That he's unable to address our problems during a crisis. Some may even question if God cares. We often question that, right? When a loved one dies, Lord, do you care for us? Why did you do this? Or when we, um, when we develop a disease, when the pandemic hit, can you not stop this, Lord? We ask that question. The truth is God created the perfect world, but sin entered into the world. Now, of course, one of the biggest questions of all is that where did evil come from? Now, I'm not discussing that today. That will take about two or three lessons, no? But just keep that in mind. If God is sovereign and there is sin in the world, that is just a reality. Sin entered the world. And the results of sin affected every aspect of creation. Thorns and thistles, he told Adam in Genesis 3, would come out because of the fall. God has chosen to allow evil to permeate his creation until a chosen time when he will make all things right. In the meantime, there will be crisis, there will be injustice, there will be typhoons, there will be earthquakes because the whole creation is groaning until the time when everything will become perfect in God's time. In the meantime, we must experience all of this. And remember, of course, what Paul said in Romans, well, you probably memorized this verse already, Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, only a sovereign God can put that in his word, and only a sovereign God can write that down because he's the only one who can make that happen. To make all things work together for good, for those who love God, and for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, let's now go to Psalm 139 so that we can understand the one true God and what he is like. We went through this psalm when we went through our series in the Psalms, one of the most beautiful, I think, that was ever written. And this psalm was written, of course, by the Holy Spirit through King David, the great psalmist of Israel. Let's read verses 1 to 6. Psalm 139, verses 1 to 6. Okay, it's not in the screen, so you have to open your Bibles. If you don't have a digital Bible, there's one just in the pew in front of you. Psalm 139, verse 1. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Now, what does this passage say about what God knows? That's one key word that we just read. You know, keeps repeating it. You discern, you search out, you know, you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. So what does this passage say about what God knows? God knows everything. 
What about King David's life did God know? King David wrote this psalm. When I sit down and I rise up, you know my thoughts from afar. Search out my path, my lying down, even his sleep. You know, you know, you know. Be even before a word is on my tongue. God knows. What about King David's life? Did God know? Well, everything. What does this tell you about God and what he knows about you? Now that gets a little personal. No. It's, in, it's written for us in dramatic form. It's an important truth. God is omniscient. And that's the first attribute that we will learn about God today. God is omniscient. That means that God is aware of all things. He understands all things. And he comprehends all things. God knows everything. Past, present, and future. He never learns anything or acquires any new knowledge. Nothing takes him by surprise. So when the March 11, 2011 earthquake happened near Tokyo, Japan, that was not a surprise to God. As I mentioned earlier, He is God. He gives blessing. He creates calamity. So God knows. And God, uh, David in this psalm actually applies God's knowledge to his own life. And as we saw earlier, his life was like an open book before God, and so is ours. Now, do you have secrets in your life? We all do, right? Maybe some secret sin that you are harboring and keeping from God, some area of your life that you've not surrendered to him. Some knowledge about you that nobody else knows. Well, I hope it doesn't come as a surprise to you that God knows. There are no secrets to him. There is nothing that you do, no sin that you commit that he cannot see. In fact, because the Holy Spirit dwells within us, indwells us as children of God, Every sin that we commit, every sinful thought, every evil motive, we commit those in the presence of God, the Holy Spirit. Now, that, that changes a lot of things, doesn't it? God's omniscience changes a lot of things. It can be comforting to a person who has nothing to hide. But it can be very disturbing to a person who does not believe God and has all sorts of mess in his life. Now, God's omniscience does not assure that we will be sinless. We will continue to sin before him. That's why our sin needed to be covered, covered by the blood of Christ. That's why a covering needs to be given to us because our sin is a stench that will um, that will really offend the holy nostrils of God if you will so his omniscience should be used for conviction so that people might turn to God so when we engage people in evangelism the, for the person that we talk to, uh, he or she knows or thinks that there are areas of his or her life that is not privy to God. Not so. God knows. He is omniscient. So, let's go to verses 7 to 12 of Psalm 139. As we continue to see the one true God and what he is like. Verses 7 to 12. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. 
If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. That's wonderful comfort, isn't it? If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. Try to meditate on that last verse. Darkness is as light with you. I don't know if you have one of these uh, Samsung phones that have a light-sensitive camera so that even at night and in the dark, you can take pictures in relatively good light. This because the camera adjusts its lens so that it can take pictures in reasonable light using available light. Now, the camera can do that. But the camera cannot turn darkness into light. Very often when we live before God, we think that there's a place where one can flee from God. According to Psalm 139, is there indeed a place where one can flee from God? The answer to that question is what? There's none. Didn't you notice? Where shall I go from your spirit? That is a, what you call a rhetorical question. The answer is that I cannot go anywhere. Then he de demonstrates it. David enumerates it. Where can I flee from your presence? Not in heaven, he said, because you are there. Not in Sheol, no? the place of the dead, because God is there. No? Not in the uttermost parts of the sea. Not in the darkness. So this passage tells us that God is not just omniscient, he knows everything, but God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. So God just does not know everything. He is everywhere. God is a spirit. So he does not occupy space. There is no place where his presence is not known. David here has fa was faced with the fact that God was intimately involved in his life. So God does, just, that, uh, God does not just know every single aspect of your life, from your sleep to your waking up to your eating, everything. He knows everything. He also is everywhere. Wherever you are, God can be present there or is present there. Just as with God's omniscience, God's omnipresence sometimes is not at all comforting. Now, if you're in trouble and you're sick or you need help or your finances are failing you, you want God to be present. And this verse, this chapter in Psalms, in the book of Psalms, tells you that he is present everywhere. So that's a comforting truth. But if you are doing something that you do not want God to see, then sorry, he is also present. There is no place to hide. Even in hell, the wicked experience the wrath of God's judgment. So God is present there, inflicting judgment upon those who have rejected him. God is fully present in all places. We can be sure of his undivided attention. We never get a busy signal, or there is no such place where it's a dead zone or a drop zone, or a drop call, or where there is no internet connection. His connection is always 1,000 Mbps all the time, every day, everywhere. In his presence, he's never preoccupied with other matters or events on the other side of the world. Because all of those, in all of these, those events, in all of those places, he is present also. Now, what changes should a person make in their life when they become aware that God is present everywhere? You know, as a believer, you should know this, that wherever you go, God goes with you, right? Because 
the Holy Spirit indwells you. So you don't want to go to places where you shouldn't be. Right? You don't want to do things that you shouldn't do. You don't want to think things that you shouldn't think. Because God can see everything. And actually, it breaks my heart sometimes because I know I sin before the presence of God. And I know that my every sin breaks His heart, grieves the Holy Spirit. And knowing that He knows everything and that He is everywhere changes your life, doesn't it? It gives you comfort when you need God. It brings conviction when you don't want Him to be around. But He is. And that doesn't change. Let's go to the latter part of Psalm 139, verses 13 to 16, as we continue to look at the one true God and what He is like. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wow. Wow. That should be a memory verse, no? I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We're talking about the womb here. The setting of these verses is a mother's womb. And the person, David, what, that he was referring to himself when he was still a fetus. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Do you know that all the days of our lives were written in our book? even before we were born. That's an amazing knowledge, right? That's our God. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. This verse or this passage definitely tells us that abortion is an abomination in the eyes of God. Because abor abortion is the murder of a person in a woman's womb. That person was fully knitted. Uh, the word for knitted, you, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. The, the word for that in the Hebrew means embroidered. You were embroidered. All of the sinews of your body, every single cell, well, where each cell has 500,000 pages of data, of information. Every single cell. He knitted together in our mother's womb. That makes every one of us special. And this tells us the third attribute of God. He is omnipotent. He creates. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Now, my wife's a doctor. You know that. When she was reviewing for the medical board, she was reviewing her gross anatomy. And she would sometimes ask for my help. She would give me her reviewer, and she would recite back to me what she had just studied. And because of that, I learned a few things. And she was studying the area of the hand and the wrist and how it operates. It is so wonderfully designed and created by God that there is no machine ever created by, by a man that can simulate the flexibility of just one finger. There is nothing that science has created that can replicate, for example, the millions of nerve endings that are in the edges of our eyeball, that connects to our brain, that perceives light and turns it into an image. That's how we see. The eye alone, and this is Charles Darwin talk, talking, the eye alone, he says, is enough to debunk my theory of evolution. He said that. Yet many people believe it. Because how can this design, how can this body of ours can be created? It is fearfully and wonderfully made. 
And David again makes a connection here about God's power and his personal existence. He was fearfully and wonderfully made by God. How much power do you think it takes to create life? Do you remember when Jesus resurrected Lazarus from the dead? It was four days he was dead. So that means that he was already decomposing. That the cells in his body, his eyes, his organs, his ear, his nose, everything was already decomposed, deteriorated. In fact, Martha said that after four days, he stinks. That's what he said, what, what she said in John 11. But God, Jesus Christ, called him forth. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Some, some commentaries say that if Jesus did not name him, every single dead person in that hill would have been resurrected with the voice of Jesus. Because God creates just by speaking. And when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, he, in a split second, just recreated every single cell of Lazarus's body from his brain to his eyes to his every muscle to his bones so that he can come out as a living, breathing being. That's creative power. That's omnipotence. There's no, crea no part of creation that stands outside his co the scope of his sovereign control. God can do whatever he wills to do. So it is not correct to say that in a crisis when people think that God is not there, that God is not able to help them or to stop the crisis from happening. Remember when there was a storm in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and his disciples were there without him because he, he was praying back uh, where they were? And this is after the feeding of the 5,000 in John chapter 6. And he walked to them on the water. How can he do that? Because he created the water. He walked on the water... And he went to them on the boat, and when he got to the boat, everything died down. There was another occasion in Mark chapter 8 where he was in the boat with his disciples, and there was this huge storm, and they feared for their lives. And when he awoke, now why was he sleeping in the middle of the storm? Because the storm was created by him. Now can he stop the storm? We have a very uh, good illustration there of how Jesus stops the storm. Jesus said, stop, and the storm ceased. In fact, his disciples marveled and they say, who is this man where even the waves and the winds obey his voice? Because he is God. Now, in our society today, in our culture, we... We like superheroes, no? Who among you uh, has a superhero favorite, no? Me, I am a big favorite of both the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the DC Universe, no? I'm very glad, as my son Jami would say, that the famous director James Gunn has shifted to DC. Hopefully DC can now catch up with Marvel, no? My favorite superhero is Silver Surfer. You don't know him, right? He appeared in the, uh, the Fantastic Four. No? Silver Surfer is my favorite superhero. No. Not Superman. Uh, not Batman. Batman does not have superpowers. He's just rich. No? Now, b being rich is his superpower. Okay? But we like to have superpowers, right? A friend once asked me, if you were to choose to have a superpower, what superpower would you like to have? I said teleportation. No? So that I don't have to take a plane ride to go anywhere. I will just think it in my head and I will just go there. There's a movie that's one of my favorites about a guy who teleports anywhere he wants. He steals from banks. He, he does all of these things. Uh, and in that movie, he is described as a demigod. We all want to have superpowers. But God has all of the superpowers that we can ever need or ask for. And God lives in us 
and we live and breathe and have our being in Him. So why should you look for superpowers? The one who has all of the superpowers in the world. By the way, uh, Marvel is fiction. DC is fiction. Iron Man is not real. Captain America is a figment of someone's imagination. Stan Lee, if I'm not mistaken. So let us not believe in our superheroes. It's fine to watch them in movies. No, We just recently watched together with our kids uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 3. No, So we really enjoyed that much. No? And we enjoy all of these superhero movies because there is a deep longing inside each one of us to have a superhero with us. Well, we have the superest hero of all. And that should convince you that in you dwells someone who has unlimited power. But in the real world, we encounter problems with disease, surging gas, gas prices, inflation. Even onion has inflation. No? We have heat waves. We have super typhoons. Our aging bodies deteriorate. Now, over the last month, I felt that very personally. No? I couldn't walk. I couldn't stand up. There was so much pain. I had to be drugged. I had to undergo physical therapy, still doing that. That's because our aging bodies deteriorate. You know, one of the realizations I made, and I'll share this with you, about how my body has deteriorated over the years, is just when I put on my pants. It used to be, it was a mindless thing, right? I put my right foot in, I put my left foot in, and then I pull up my pants. Today, it's an ordeal just to put on my pants. It's an ordeal. I have to will myself to bring up my right leg up. And then once I bring it up, I can't shoot it into the pants. And then it's even harder with my left leg where my injury is. So, beloved, our bodies age. And we shouldn't mind that because we have a God who has superpowers. Now, He does not guarantee that He will resolve all of our problems with the superpowers in this life. He can and He may, but He may not also. That perhaps the greatest super thing that can happen to us, in fact, because, you know, what are you afraid of when there's disease? Death, right? What are you afraid of when you can't eat because your money is not enough to buy things? Hunger, starvation, that leads to what? Death, right? What are you afraid of when your body ages and you can't function as well? Death, right? And beloved, for us who are in the Lord, death ushers us in to a realm where we become superheroes with superpowers. Why will you not want to embrace death? We have a God who is omnipotent. Now, I just want to maybe end this with the, the last two verses of Psalm 139. And it says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. In the end of all of this truth that he put into a song, King David was so overwhelmed by God's omniscience, God's omnipresence, and God's omnipotence, that he was so convicted about him and his sinfulness and how he fell so much short of the glory of God. And so he said, search me, O God. You know, there's an old hymn that has these lyrics. I don't know if you know the hymn. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. My 
forgot the other lyrics. That's part of the aging. No? But that is a wonderful hymn. No? And we should learn hymns like that because it has the truth of God in them. Try me and know my thoughts, David said. And see if there is any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's where he will get all of his superpowers. In the way everlasting, the way everlasting is to be in the presence of God. Yes, God is present with us every day in this life. But he will be even more present in the spirit when we go to the way everlasting. David longed for that and he knows that he has to rid himself of all of his sin. And so he prays, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Now God knows his thoughts. We already know that. God sees his heart. But David can't. So he prays, search me, O God. By the way, that is your assignment. You will memorize verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there is be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Okay, now your Bible might be an NIV. Or it might be an ESV like mine. I'm reading it from the ESV. But you can memorize this verse. The other verse that you may want to memorize, of course, is verse 14. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Let's close our time of study with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word and how it clearly shows us that you know everything and that you are everywhere and that you can do anything. We thank you, Lord, for your omniscience. We thank you, Father, for your omnipresence. We praise you, Lord, for your omnipotence. But Father... The reason why these truths are so precious to us today is because we know that the God who has these is the God who lives within us. And that is a great comfort for us. But we also know that that is a great source of conviction for us. Help us then to be like David, that we might pray to you, search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there is any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. May we live holy lives because you know everything, because you are everywhere, and because you can do anything. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen.